Danny Dyer's Deadliest Men is one of the most unintentionally hilarious TV shows I have ever seen. If you're not familiar with this show or Danny Dyer, let me give you a little crash course history lesson in the geyser himself. Danny Dyer is an English actor from East London known for playing cockney tough guys. The most popular role he's known for where he plays a London hard man is definitely Mick Carter from the soap opera East Enders. However, Danny isn't much of a tough guy at all, and he's never really claimed to be one. He just had a rough look to him and a funny London geezer accent, so he just works for being cast as these tough guys. But back in 2008, someone had the bright idea to make a show where Danny Dyer meets up with real hard gangster geezers from all over the UK and Ireland. And so, Danny Dyer's Deadliest Men was born, and let me tell you, it is an underrated classic. I really don't think this show gets the respect it deserves, and for that reason, I just had to make a video about it, and I thought no better episode of the show to talk about than the very first episode, and in my opinion, the very best episode, where Danny meets infamous reformed Liverpool gangster Stephen the Devil French. Stephen French was the most infamous man in Liverpool back in the 80s. The man was the scouse Omar Little of his era, and was infamous for robbing drug dealers of their money and making them shit themselves when he did it. He's about 6 foot 5, 250 pounds, and looks like Thanos fucked Ben Kingsley. When he got his start in living a life of crime, he wanted a reputation of being the baddest man in town and would specifically target drug dealers to rob because he knew they couldn't go to the police and he knew he was harder than them. Growing up in Liverpool in the late 70s when it was one of the most racist cities in the UK as a black kid was no cakewalk for Stephen either. He's spoken about in the past still having scares on his neck to this day from when skinhead gangs whipped him with a chain in his younger years. He also talked about being a victim of police brutality from the age of 11, so shit was very real for a young Stephen French. Stephen is also a former European and British kickboxing champion, which is exactly why he was such a mighty opponent for his rivals in the streets. I tell you all this to tell you that when Ponzi fucking fake heart man Danny Dyer met with this absolute monster of a man. It made for one of the best viewing experiences I have ever had. The whole episode is pretty much just Danny Dyer being absolutely scared shitless of French while Stephen half babysits him, half intimidates him and there's some serious hilarious standout moments from this one. The first one that I find absolutely hilarious is when Steven is talking about how he wants to keep Danny and the camera crew safe while recording him, so he tells them that they could find themselves in some danger as they follow Steven into a certain area of Liverpool, so Steven is adamant on getting out of the area as quick as they possibly can. Danny appreciates this and then refers to Steven as a good boy, but then immediately shits it and calls him a good man, not meaning to disrespect him. <laughs> All the attention we were getting. Camera draws attention. Yeah. Don't want to get, you know, these are professionals. Don't want to get you drawn into my shit. So we'll be quick, in and out. Yeah. Okay. Good boy. All right. Good man. Okay. Another really good bit is when Danny and Stephen go into the dojo where Stephen trains at, and Stephen takes off his shirt and explains the tattoo on his back to Danny, talking about how it symbolizes if you disrespect Stephen's honor or integrity, you have unleashed the beast inside him. And Danny just has the most lackluster shit reaction ever. Yeah. Then I was pure pain. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. That's who I am. That's what I'm about. And I wear it on my back. That's with me for my life. This this dragon is on it. This dragon on this side is integrity. And within side, in the middle, is the beast. I'm the beast within. If you cross the twin dragons of honor and integrity, the beast within is released. Yeah. And once the beast is released. The only way you can put him back in his cage is to sate him, which is to feed him, or to slay him, which is to kill him. And that's the way I live my life. 
If you cross me, you've got to feed me or you've got to kill me. And it's as simple as that. Mad way to live your life, you know what I mean? It's, no, it's a cold, man. It's, 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 cold. it's, a, it's a discipline and it's, it's something that you live. Yeah, mate, it's, it's a mad way to live your life, isn't it? It's a discipline and it, it's a cult. Shut up, Danny. That's really the best you can do. Like, you're getting paid to be here. Anyway, Stephen and Danny then roleplay what it was like when Stephen used to rob drug dealers, which, fair enough, we all have our kinks, Danny, get in there. And this leads to Stephen recalling a story of when he made a, quote, 17 stone bodybuilder shit his kicks while robbing the poor fucker. After this uh, weird encounter they have with each other, the camera cuts to Danny outside smoking a fag to settle his nerves for a bit. And then Danny narrates that while he was shook after the encounter, after a bit of time he's back to his old self. And by that he means trying to fuck grannies. I needed to take a breather and get some fresh air. Luckily, before too long, I was back to my old self. All right, girls. Hiya. You all right, love? A couple of salts. Yeah, get in there, Danny, mate. Cool. Following this strange scene, Stephen discusses how the death of his best friend and partner in crime, Andrew John's death, affected him and motivated him to reform and turn his life around completely. Andrew John was Stephen's right-hand man, the stringer bell to his Avon Barksdale. So when Andrew was shot dead in the early 90s, this completely turned Stephen's life upside down and he knew he had to make a change after this. He talks about how after this he embraced education and longed to look after his family in a legitimate way rather than in a criminal way. And how if he can save one young man's life, black, white, Chinese, whatever, from a premature grave at the hands of gun violence following a life of crime, it would all be worth it. This anti-crime message and lifestyle that Stephen was promoting did lead to some backlash from the younger generation of gangsters in Liverpool who falsely labelled Stephen a snitch and a nonce for standing up for what he believes in. This pretty much brings us to the end of the episode. And honestly, the episode portrays Stephen in a really good light as a reformed criminal who should be seen as a hero in his community. However, he isn't safe in his community because of his anti-gun message that made him a target for the new generations of gangsters in his city. But this was 2008, and you're probably wondering, well, where is Stephen French now? Well, Stephen French is still alive and well, you know, black don't crack and to this day is still beefing with younger gangsters over the internet and is trying to spread his message to the youth about getting them out of the streets but i don't know the more i looked into steven the more i found him a shady character especially in a clip from a podcast he did with sean atwood where he spoke about having a friendship with akin arabiki aka purple aki someone who is infamous for assaulting young boys around Liverpool by squeezing their muscles and someone I've made a video about before. Stephen spoke about being friends with Aki after Aki helped him win a legal battle but I don't know. While that was a kind gesture from Purple Aki, I still wouldn't associate with someone as infamous as literally the most infamous sexual predator in all of Liverpool. Especially if I was Stephen, someone who already has a target on their back. What made me even more uncomfortable about all this is in another interview Sean Atwood did with another Liverpool gangster named Darren G, Darren made some claims that Purple Aki was protected by the criminals of Liverpool because he was useful to them. Not only because Aki is knowledgeable about the legal system, but because he was used to threaten victims of these criminals because of his reputation for abusing young children. So now, for me, there's a big question mark over whether or not Stephen was one of the men responsible for protecting this absolute monster, but that is something we may never know. And that brings me to the end of this week's video. I really hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, please give it a like, and please do subscribe if you're new, because it helps me out a lot. 
because I will be uploading a whole lot more videos like this one very soon. Thank you very much for watching. Peace. See you later. Love you. Goodbye.